tough. It's just tough because I feel like Stephen is like a really, really good person. Like a lot of people think that the only reason I'm friends with him is because of like the personal benefits that I have. And that's actually in part why I never go on his stream is because I'm worried that he and others will be like the only reason I'm friends with him is because of like a game. But I just, I just think he's a like deeply good person, even though he's a very flawed person as well. Um, and he's a much better person than he gives himself credit for. And it makes me sad because he'll just like take other people talking like pretty horribly about him. And he's like, I mean, yeah, I have lots of flaws. And he'll just like own it. And I'm like, bro, if you were literally anybody else who's more shitty than you, you would be like demanding that people like see your side part. I, I don't know. I just, maybe I'm biased. Obviously, he's a different mind, but I think yeah. he doesn't like, advocate for even how wonderful of a person he is. Like, yeah, I think most people, when I say good, I don't mean flaw, like no flaws. I don't mean perfect. I mean, there's lots of flaws. But there's like a striving and an intentionality to try to see like improvement there. And maybe he hasn't always been that way. But since I've been interacting, I see like this intentionality to try to take responsibility and like to try to self improve. And like, goddamn, there's not a lot of people that are trying as hard as he is. And I, I don't know, I just really appreciate that about him and other people. Um, yeah, I think it's just, yeah, I struggle because the good is fake. If you're going to ask me like, is Stephen kind? I would just say, yeah, in a lot of ways he is. Like, that's an easy one for me to define. And like, no lot of examples of that would look like as someone who behaves like that. But I think, yeah, I'm just, yeah. And it's not, your, it's not you. It's like, uh, everyone does this, right? When they say this is a good person, this is a bad person, and uh, me over here with my autism brain is like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> How does this look? I don't know. What is a good person? I'm confused. But, yeah, I'd no, say like it's not very nice. He's an asshole. He's got lots of flaws, but I do think he's good like, in, a, in a deep, well-rounded way. I was watching Jay Stock's YouTube channel when Lav short for Lav Loon, who used to go by Femoid, now goes by Ambush, was laughing at not so erudite defending Destiny's good character. When he's like blind to his own flaws, I think he's really blind to it. I think what's unique about him as well is that like he's pretty open to hearing his flaws. He just needs to like hear it in the right, right way, which to be honest feels deeply, deeply human. Um, I don't see him as painting himself as like just the victim in this situation because I yeah, his him. his problem is that he's too accountable, right, Kyla? He's just he's so charitable. He's too accountable. Loud. Okay, so so that was our voice. Okay. Wait, look. Yeah. That's not what I, I sound like. I'm gonna panel with you later, but you are on my shit list too because you make false accusations against people. So, like, I'm not very excited about dealing with you either, Miss. Like, I do not make false accusations, <laughs> and I do not lie, Christ. right? You're, like, miss. that is the one thing I will not do. I've never let about There was a destiny. smear campaign against you. There was a smear campaign against you, just as there was one against me. Okay, if that was I'm actually a you false literally act. did. So no, I'm Ray. judging you on if your actions. I was actions, a false just like allegor, judging... I would not be in this fucking space. I'd be I'm not so judging you on the smear campaign. I'm judging you on your own actions, just like I'm not judging you don't anyone know... else on any smear campaign. Okay, I'm not even. I'm not even. This isn't about me. I'd love for this to be about me, but it's not <laughs> about me. Brittany Simon jumping in to shit on Lav it feels kind of personal to me, because Lav is one of the few people who join the conversation to be critical of Destiny, which Brittany says is what she wants people to do, uh, and despite. Being met with hostility, Lav goes on, or later on in the conversation, to extend an olive branch to Brittany again. Last thing, because Brittany, Brittany said that she had to go. Last thing, Brittany, I don't know if you've been uh, reading J Just Lick's chat, Lav take. but I just really quickly, and just I'm going to make lick. it about me, so I'm so sorry. But literally every other, like, every five comments is like, Brittany's lying, all she does is lie, all, the, all Brittany does is lie. And that's what his community has been doing to me. And my narrative has been completely taken from me. So I understand that you have beef with me because of what you think that has happened. Lab, please stop. If you would no. like to have no. it. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. Lab, I do not judge people <laughs> off what other people say. I judge you based off what you do and say. Don't pull this on me, girl. Come you, on. I'm too no. old. No. no. This is fucking insane. No. Okay, hold on. Here, according to the theory of positive disintegration developed in the 1960s by Polish psychologist and psychiatrist Kazimierz Dobrowski, Brittany's response is a classic level one behavior. Of Dobrowski's five levels of human development, the first is the most basic primitive level, driven by the satisfaction or basic needs and desires as an individual's only concern, often disregarding empathy, sympathy, or any acknowledgement of the needs and concerns of others. A bit of introspection could help with that, but that's for another video. What inspired this video was later on in that same call seeing Nato Erudite struggle in an argument with Lav and resort to using Lav's sexual assault as an attack against her. I definitely wouldn't uh, be surprised that this is like the Here first time that you've like lied. I, I mean, I have I screenshots. Kyla, I've, been, I've, Kyla, I've really I've never seen screenshots. I have screenshots her. of you claiming that the girl who slept with Hassan had to sign an NDA. Kyla, yeah. I've never seen you be really this immature before. Isn't it? Uh, 
like I, I it's what? it's not really that obfuscating. Issue. Well, the NBA. issue is like is she Holy going to lie? Oh. Is it possible this that she's talking to this is and this is, and this, is this is something is that I said about Kyla in her possible? in her is debate with Big Papa Fascist. Is it possible? Is it possible? Lately, if you have a pattern, if you have a pattern of behavior of lying, if you have a pattern of behavior of lying about things like contracts, mm -hmm. about lying about things like like essays, let me say one more time. The reality is like I'm willing to believe that you also if lied about like some level of contract. One, I've never lied about sexual assault. Oh, hold on, sorry. <laughs> I really can't get past this. I really, sorry, Nick. I'm going to let you finish. Love you. Love you, boo. But I really, I really just got to hit one thing really She's quick. Is that, is that another thing is that, Kyla, when you come up here and then you virtue signal to Destiny's audience that already are fucking losing favor with you because you're boring and annoying, um, to virtue signal and be like, you lie about sexual assault when you don't know the story, you don't know me, and you only see like a propagandized version of, uh, of information spread at me, that's fucking disgusting. And you want to talk about being like a pick me and being a feminist? Don't you call yourself a feminist and you're saying that I'm lying about a sexual assault that I've been very, very open with the fact that I have very mixed feelings about and the fact that I don't really know how to respond to it or what if it is sexual okay, assault okay. or if I, I would call it that. I think that is very disingenuous and very point. disgusting, frankly. It feels like the fight should uh, end there, but you know, not so erudite does not accept that she's wrong. Even at the thought that she might be wrong, we have to really wait over and consider that she could be right. It's just frustrating. It's frustrating to see people do this. Uh, and I understand most people who are in the middle of a debate, they're very slow to consider the idea that they are incorrect, which is why Erudite and her husband, Nick, later on, uh, interrogate Lav on her inconsistency in describing her sexual assault just so that they can prove that she's a liar. How do you know You're that right. I lied about my sexual assault? I mean, all you guys do, I didn't it's say that so you lied stupid. About I said you've gone back and forth about your sexual assault. No, you said that I lied about my sexual assault literally in this call. Okay, the uh, situation about like pushing towards your You said that it was essay, now it isn't, then it was. You went back so and that's forth about that that's situation. Lying? Then you, yes, yes. I don't and think then, that you'd and then, would call that and then you said that I was going around siding with people who were uh, dismissing your essay, but you were dismissing it, but also they couldn't dismiss it, even though you were dismissing it, and it was, but it wasn't an essay. You've gone back and forth about literally everything constantly all day. You've explicitly come out and said okay. that how ABBA engaged with it was bad. The, okay, like, so it's not a lie, is what I'm saying. You said that you counted that as a lie. It's not. And then another thing is that it me is talking about back and forth and you say that I'm siding with people who are denying your essay. I have not said that I since Nick has talked to me about that, I have not said that because it's been cleared up. So I it that's not a lie. I just simply think of I see it differently now. You um because lied and then it got cleared up, which is no, great, it's not you a just lie. Were it's not a lie. Lie. I have three different <clears throat> mutual friends DM me talking to me about my character because you had told them that I was going around denying your SA, which never happened literally ever oh, wait, wait. But I, I cleared up the happen. situation yeah but then when we cleared up the situation did you go to those people and be like you just did you not know, clear it up she, with me you Nick did not did. clear it up Nick no, did Nick, Nick, Nick did. did a month yeah. after two yeah. months yeah. after about my character. Just because yeah, what you get you in do? your feelings and you don't give a fucking second to consider whether or not this would map onto my character oh doesn't my mean you're not f lying in the situation. If you think only lying is when you intentionally tell a fib, then you're f retarded about what lies are. You can lie by not understanding or giving bad faith. I've, I've heard you call it salt, and I've heard you call it absolutely not a um, but rather a weird situation that happened that you thought was funny and yeah. i feel like i've maybe heard you call it a rape before but i could be wrong i could be completely wrong but also i don't know what the difference between well, if no, a rape the is, definition of rape is like digital it's coercive it's anything with it's any single thing without consent so i don't okay. know i don't know if i even want to define it it was something that happened to me that made me uncomfortable that i look back yeah. on realize so that if it, you yeah is, is, is there a difference between calling a thing assault when a person is physically holding you and making you doing a making you do a act that you don't want, and you call it assault, is that different from rape in any meaningful way? Yeah, so it's not. Necessary. I don't know. No, but in, so in the would it could it could it possibly not be rape if someone is holding you down and making you do a 
act that you don't want, but you will call it assault. Is there any way that that is not also at all? But this, so the situation with Gabriel Gundacker, you you'd say that it wasn't a rape, but it was a sexual assault. Is that correct? I don't fucking know what it was. Okay. Gabriel Gundacker is, is that, that his name? name? I think that's his name. Yeah. I think like forcing okay, well, so, someone to okay. sit on you is also considered rape and stuff like that. Like, I mean, I, I would definitely I consider it. I don't know how if, we're de if, divided. If you're having a sexual interaction with someone and they grab your head and force uh, their your mouth into your into their while they're saying like no, don't. Do we have to like go over this like detail? By yeah, that doesn't fun. seem fun. I mean, yeah. you've called that yeah. situation. It's Salt. Trademark, though. And then when asked about the situation and whether it was not what is there salt, you've like kind of been like, ha, no, of course not. It was just some crazy, silly, weird thing. I didn't call it. I would never call it. Right. So it's like, but then you also talk about how it was really horrible and called it. Would... And what I'm trying to say is, I don't know what the difference between sexual assault with someone doing all of those things that we just talked about. I don't know how that's not. What what you'll say, what you've said, what you said the other day was, yeah. come on, that was not shit. That was not a. F I've never called it a, f right? Yeah, I, I don't think I've, I don't think I would I would not call it a. R but I, if there are people watching this that something like that has happened to them and they call it a rape, then who am I to say that it wasn't r to them? Yeah, it's kind of like Schrodinger's lie because what you think is the truth or how you want to describe it changes conversation to conversation and that would be fine that would be fine on its own i think the issue is that which you, my, then, my sexual assault. you that you then use those underlying facts which change depending on how you're feeling about it at the time to justify other things for example why kyla is so bad for associating with this person and why you're justified in hating her now i don't really care it's the behavior it itself assault. that i have an issue with it it definitely was sexual assault. Then why, um, like yesterday, when you were talking to Jistic or whatever, you said that it literally wasn't. Well, she said it literally wasn't rape. She said it literally was. She said it. Yeah, I didn't say that it wasn't rape, and she laughed oh, at the idea think, that it was. Was I? Yeah, because this? you think that yes. SA yes. is not serious and rape is I don't serious. Know. I guess no, no, no. I don't know. Here's the issue. It's like if depending on who you're talking to about the Gundacker situation, it's like, <laughs> come on, I would never call it this. This was just a weird situation. But then in another conversation with another person, when you're able I to use it- I always call this sexual assault. I always call this sexual assault. It's, it's, I, I, I know, I understand. Yesterday you called it a weird situation. Uh, yes, but that, sometimes that is just how you say sexual assault if you are Ooh. in a room of men what? who- What do you mean? Uh, first of all, why it is- why, Then it is why do you feel like I'm denying it? Oh, you're suddenly well. saying that I'm an I'm SA a, denier. But when it's, you, when it's a room you, of I, men- no. <laughs> When it's a room of Kyla. men, now it's just a weird I need you. Yeah, 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 so I, a chatter was like, is this situation that Lav was talking about her Substack post about? The chatter said, is this the uh, the the salad tossing situation, whatever? And then Lav yeah. goes, no, not that situation. I would never call that. A that was just like a weird interaction that I have that I joke about sometimes because I think it's funny. Okay. That's yeah. the context of, of that piece. Right? And Minus so what, 153 from yesterday's stream. In case yeah, yeah, to. sure. Yeah, but so if you change the facts of a circumstance that you no like based were no on facts the relation, based, based, yeah, the fact is the severity of the interaction in question. I'm not, I don't have a problem with you being dismissive with men. And if that's how you feel why you have to be dismissive, uh, that mostly just makes me sad if you genuinely feel like the situation is serious. My problem exclusively- I don't even know how I fucking feel about it, but you- That's fine. Hold on. I'm not done. I know how I feel about you. No, I'm, not I, I'm not freaking out about this. We're looping on this. Yes, you did. You yelled at me. I, mean, I, think, I think like Lab's actually freaking out about it too. Everybody's making a huge deal out of it. This just doesn't really We're making like a huge thing. deal because this is part of the evidence to how she is dishonest and plays very soft and, and light-handed with the truth. When they realized how, how off this was, because other people on the call were bringing it up, uh, Not So Eridate then blamed Lav for her SA even being a topic that they're discussing now, which is just wrong. Not So Eridate's the one who brought it up when she used it as an attack in a very antagonistic and offensive way. If you have a pattern of behavior of lying, if you have a pattern of behavior say of lying about time. things like contracts, mm -hmm. about lying about things like, like, SA, Let me say one more time. the reality is like, I'm willing to believe that you also lied about, like, some level of contract.
Everything about this interaction bothered me. It's not the content creator or the person not so erudite presents herself to be. I, I know these are concepts that not so erudite understands. The fact that victims are insecure and sometimes inconsistent at describing or even labeling their trauma or essay. Seeing her spend the first half of the stream being able to defend Destiny despite his public narrative and his self-abandonment, but not be able to uh, extend those same understandings to an SA victim just because it's lab feels really incompassionate and really dishonest to me. I know that Erudite has been really open about having an issue with her public perception and people not liking her. Uh, she thinks it's because she's a woman and that essentially sexism is the reason why people don't like disagreeableness coming from her. And I just, I had to sit on this. I had to think about this. Because, um, like, I do hate women. But this isn't sexism or misogyny making me feel off about Kyla. Um... Yeah, no, it's not that. It's it's literally her actions. It's how she behaves. It's the things that she says. Something about not so erudite is just not so authentic. Which of your thoughts and things that you say are you? And maybe so you can not utilize the rest, or maybe so that you can correct the rest, because they're not representative of yourself as, a, as an integrated being. They don't take everything into account. My sense has been that you can tell when you're saying something that's not authentic by feeling out whether or not it makes you weak or strong. Now, you know sometimes when you're conversing with people, you can say something that embarrasses yourself. Now, Nietzsche said, for example, everyone has perjured themselves at least once in the attempt to maintain their good name. Something like that. It's not an exact quote, but I've got the gist of it right. So maybe you're saying things to impress someone, or you're saying things to remain part of your political group or your social group or whatever, or maybe you have attributes, personal attributes, that might be positive, that you're ashamed of and so you're not going to speak about them. So there's a falseness about your self-representation. Watch for two weeks and see. Make a rule that if you start to say something and it makes you feel weak, it's hard to describe exactly what that means. To, to me, what it means is that I can feel things coming apart, sort of in my midsection, so I think it's an autonomic phenomena. And the, the subjective sense is of, of falsehood. It's like I've just stepped off the solid ground and onto something that, that doesn't support me well, and it, it feels like a self-betrayal. So that's existential inauthenticity. You can feel it right away. And then the rule is, shut up, if that happens. Stop talking. And then feel around and see if you can find some words that you can say in that situation that don't produce that sensation. And it's like, you see this played out in different forms of drama. So it's not all that obvious why a cliché is a bad thing, but a cliché is a bad thing in the same way that being possessed by the dead is a bad thing. It's like a cliché isn't you. It's something else. It's like the crowd. It's like the other. It's, it's not living. It has nothing to do with you. And part of the reason that students use cliches is because it's easier than, than using your own genuine creative formulation. So you can just default to cliche use. But there's something more insidious than that, is that if you write an essay that's nothing but a string of cliches, and you get criticized, then you're not being criticized. What's being criticized is the cliches, and you can hide behind that. And, and the, the part of you that's wise but but treacherous, thinks, well, the criticism doesn't really apply to me because, you know, I didn't really say what I thought. And then there's this kind of sense you get that you've gotten away with something, which is a terrible thing. So when I read undergraduate essays, what I see very frequently is, especially the first essay, it's just nothing but cliches. It's awful. It's, it's dull. You can hardly stand reading it because there's nothing in it that's gripping or alive. And then maybe the second essay, you can see there's a layer of cliché. And then now and then, the person will be brave enough to poke up 
a thought of their own. It'll just sort of poke up somewhere maybe in three pages in. It's like this little green shoot that's barely alive. And the, the person is brave enough to pop it up in the hope that, you know, maybe it won't get walloped down with a sledgehammer. And so one of the things I try to do is to point that out. It's like, look, you know, this is something, there's a real thought here. It's a real original thought. It's something that you have the right to, because it's derived from your own experience and your own knowledge. And you've formulated it in an original and compelling way. But the problem with that is that if you get criticized for that, you're just going to pull right back into your shell, right? Because that hurts, because it's actually part of you that you've exposed. And that's a terrifying thing, to expose yourself like that. But it, it's, it's an absolute prerequisite to genuine communication and thought. There is a list of behaviors that contribute to why not so erudite comes off inauthentically to me. And they include her lacking humility, uh, having a superiority complex, avoiding further explanation by appealing to authority or status when under pressure, uh, having a manipulative communication style, either through her word choice or indirectness. And then the focus of this video will be behaving hypocritically. People don't like liars, but hypocrisy is so much more than just lying. It's deception. It's self-deception. It's the misrepresentation of one's moral character. We're adverse to hypocrites so much that we find it cathartic to see uh, other people call them out. It's become a form of entertainment to watch other people call out bad behavior. It's just infuriating to me when I see people like Pokimane or Eco Lull, or I guess Hassan, to a more severe extent. Be these multi-millionaires who have only benefited from the current state of the world, and yet do this act where they're like condescendingly talking down to everyone, being like, yeah, I'm one of you guys, you know, fuck the rich. I'm with you. No, you're not. You're rich as fuck. Go away. I can't tell if it's a cynical thing with them where they think they'll get more e-cloud from being pro, you know, socialism, I guess, because it's the, the hip-hop thing these days. Um, but secretly, they just don't give a shit. Or maybe they're actually just like really stupid and actually believe what they're saying, despite the obvious cognitive dissonance. Genuinely don't know. I definitely- So, she talks shit about him only doing content on bigger streamers, when all she ever did was literally abandoned smaller streamers, like, content panels and shit like that to jump on Destiny stream whenever the fuck he would let her on. And is right now, at this very moment, watching and restreaming a larger streamer's content. That is what she is doing. But you're in sex work because you can't offer value in the marketplace. When you say can't offer value in the marketplace, well, in which marketplace? Because in the sport marketplace, clearly she offers value. She's making a lot of money on it. So that doesn't make any sense, right? A lot of people don't offer value across the entire marketplace. You only offer value in the place that you specialize in. We have a specialized economy. That's how labor works. Just like this Mark White guy or whatever only offers value in, I guess, scam artistry. That's all he does. That's why every startup that he was with failed. That's why the only awards he ever posts are vague ones that he receives on behalf of companies that have never produced an actual or real product. That's why every past Twitter account associated with every business or idea that he's ever worked on has 4,000 followers and died four years ago. And that's why he lies about the background of his education, right? Is because he doesn't offer value. Christians probably are really kind people. I think Republicans are probably very kind people. I don't think that they're like these monsters. The problem is that they become obsessed with the sin of others rather than looking at themselves a lot more. And I think if you're going to be the type that's constantly encouraging society to slow down and to be the brakes on it, I think like greater self-accountability is required. I'm not really interested in listening to a Christian talk about how a trans person is a bad person when they treat their wife like they are gluttonous, they're extremely obese and overweight, and they underpay their workers. I'm not interested in it. I don't care what you have to say, but you, you have no moral ground to these we don't hold all hypocrites to the same degree, of course. Uh, even as a society, we determine that some forms of hypocrisy are um, problematic, which can be really insufferable for those who are constantly put under the microscope for their transgressions. Hypocrisy is always newsworthy. If somebody is a religious Christian and then they have an affair, this is a newsworthy event, according to the media. If there's a politician who's right wing, that politician turns out to be gay. Really, really newsworthy, according to the media. But there is one area of hypocrisy that is just not newsworthy to the media, like truly not newsworthy. And that, of course, is if you are a socialist who's extremely wealthy and gives very little charity. If you are that person, then hypocrisy just doesn't play a part. Hypocrisy is never a problem because, after all, you're calling for societal change. You yourself don't have to abide by any of those rules because some animals are more equal than other animals. But the socialist has the benefit of the bargain because you get to be as socialist as you want to, like Bernie Sanders, and then you get to have a lake house. You get to be a millionaire while proclaiming that billionaires on the the flesh up. The charge is that for a socialist, you seem to be spending large, my friend. It doesn't matter. Like, 
you could have, there are a lot of places that are not in West Hollywood that don't cost $2.7 million. They're all over the United States. You can get yourself a tiny little shack and live yourself the Henry David Thoreau lifestyle for probably 30 grand somewhere. 2.7 million bucks, a lot of money. I don't see you handing that out to all of the immiserated workers in the Marxist social construct, right? That's the charge. And his response is, well, of course it's expensive around here. This is West Hollywood, which of course is not a response. Piker said three weeks later, quote, as long as you don't defang your core values, as long as you're still speaking truth to power, then F them. Yeah, speaking truth to power is being the guy who buys the $3 million house and does interviews with New York Magazine and then jabbers about how the rich don't pay their fair share. When Ben Shapiro says a uh, Christian politician having an affair, we instantly understand the hypocrisy. We can instantly see it. But when the subject of scrutiny is seen as unproblematic and avoids accountability, that's when commentators like Ben Shapiro have to put in more effort to demonstrate how they are problematic and how they should be held accountable. The degrees in which we view hypocrisy depends on a lot of factors, starting with moral engagement. I forget who says this um, or who I'm quoting, but society suffers when people stay silent on moral issues. People who call out the mistreatment of others and find injustice hard to ignore may sometimes feel led to take action or influence others through their uh, positive behavior. This is moral engagement. When you share your moral opinion or call out bad behavior uh, and encourage others to donate or volunteer, you are morally engaging. And the public rewards you for moral engagement. They reward you for your moral engagement. But this reward, it comes with new risks. It comes with the cost of hypocrisy when you act imperfectly, uh, at least according to your own expressed moral values. The most positively perceived hypocrite is the honest hypocrite. Take, for example, the mess that is Darius IRL. Um, in this clip that I'm going to show you, he wants to tell his chat to, and his ex-girlfriend, to stop bullying another streamer. Um, one that he, he had collaborated with before, but before he engaged morally with his chat, he engaged morally with himself. Grace has ever beaten the shit allegations. Um, I'm gonna have a hot take. I'm gonna have a hot take. Uh, I think I'm the one at fault for Grace. Leaving again. Another hot take. I don't think it's Grace's fault, almost at all. I, I, I'm gonna be honest. I don't like. I don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna interact with Grace on stream, or involve her in my streams anymore going forward because I, I realize things. Uh. But I don't think I'm gonna publicly. I don't, I don't think I can publicly do anything with Grace again. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of your guys' fault. It's also my fault for being a pussy. I thought she'd be like, "Hey, like this shit's going on, and this is what I want to do." She was scared because I was gonna slide. You just look retarded saying that. Um, uh, let's start off with good news. Publicly, I'm gonna talk to her after Delander. Um, I don't think I'm gonna talk to her really. If I talk to her, it's gonna be uh, pretty chill, like pretty tame, because like I can't do it. It makes me, she makes me sad. She makes me really sad. She's gonna fucking. She makes me want to cry sometimes. It's fucking gay. Uh, but she wants to make me, she makes me very upset. Because I care for well-being. <laughs> Fuck you, retard. Uh, it's, 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 uh, I, I, I care for, like, I care, but I care for also everyone else's well-being. You know what I mean? Like, I cry over fucking Xena. I cry over people that I, I know are just trying to live. Uh, so it's nothing too serious. Uh, what the fuck is wrong with you? How does she make you cry? Uh, bro, she's already fucking- dude, you guys are just so fucking- Dude, people are just suck, dude. <laughs> Don't fucking compare me. I'm not comparing you to a fucking asshole. Oh my god, dude. Oh, shit. There's something I- I fucking- I can't even get my camera off, bro. <laughs> Where the fuck is it on my thing? Thank you. You guys are like so fucked, dude. It's like the response, the response of like, like I didn't, I didn't get to talk about why it is. You guys are just like she. Her, she her. 
Oh, she's a piece of shit. Like, I, I did that. It's whatever. Fucked. It's fucked. Yeah. I, yeah, it's fucked. You're crying? Why, why, why do you think I'm crying, you fucking asshole? Oh, fuck, get, just get out of my space, you know? If, like, now just, just, just get away from me. If you can't accept me for I am, just fucking go! I'm like, I'm like so tired of it, dude. Just go! You are so fucking lame, dude. If you don't get it, you'll never get it. You'll never fucking get it because you're incapable. You're just incapable, dude. Just fucking do something else. Grace doesn't do herself any favors. Yes, I get it. Grace doesn't do anything to help her situation at all in any way, shape, or form. She doesn't want help. She doesn't care. She wants to live her life. She wants to do whatever. I, I get I, I genuinely do get it. I get it, and I understand that. I genuinely do get it. I genuinely do get it. I genuinely do get it. But why why do, why does bully... Do I just sit there just bully somebody? Just, like, for free? Like, no one's there to even, like... Look, I'm gonna read your messages out loud, because I'm just, I'm just tired of it, dude. Like, I'm not gonna let you use shit against me, either! Just fuck off! That's why I didn't want to fucking pick up the fucking PS5 because you're not gonna sit there and just use it against me, dude. Like, it's just actually fucked. You're just a fuck B. Just get the fuck out of here. There are several reasons Darius's hypocrisy can be publicly perceived with minimal negative judgment. He is engaging in pro-social behavior at a cost to himself by trying to prevent the excessive bullying of another streamer. He does not misrepresent his flawed character or hide the fact that he also engaged in the bullying of this streamer and he expresses the emotional cost of violating these morals to urge others how to engage. Darius is not a perfect person, and he's not going to start being a perfect person now, which is most likely why he doesn't engage morally very often. But you know who does? Not so erudite, however, has built her entire platform off of her moral engagement. And despite her reputation for being a logical thinker, uh, her understanding of the risks of living up to the standards that she set is about on par with that of the millionaire socialist Hassan. And so I guess the thing is, I think it's totally fine to hold me to a higher standard than you hold other people to. But if you like, there has to come like a benefit of the doubt with that. Like, I, there are people that you're going to have different expectations from based on the way that they engage themselves and, like, purport themselves. And I think it's fine enough for people to be like, well, you purport yourself pretty professionally and, like, empathetic, so we, like, hold you to that standard. But that also means that there has to come, like, benefit of the doubt that comes with that. Like, if, if all that respect does is just increase expectation, then that person gets all of the cons of respect and none of the benefits. It just means, like, because I'm conducting myself well more often of the time, I just have less wiggle room, basically, which is crazy. Um, which is fine. That is how we operate. But that also means that it has to be like better than they'll give it. And that, like, okay. Eridae believes that there's only increased expectations and no positives to the respect her moral engagement and professionalism has granted her. Uh, despite her following, view count, and career as an influencer. When it comes to moral engagement, the expectations you're held to are the ones that you set for yourself. Uh, they do not increase without your say. And just like Hassan, when he reaps the rewards for engaging morally by advocating for better working conditions and compensation for the workers at Amazon, he opens himself up to the criticism of his personal behavior as an employer if he does not live up to those same expressed moral values. Not so erudite doesn't like the expectations that she's being held to. Uh, she can look to herself to understand why. Do you believe that, are you saying that porn addiction is not true? It's not real? A problem not so erudite encounters, not so infrequently, is feeling a sudden surge of confidence and impulsively acting on it without the knowledge needed to be able to effectively communicate her understanding to a panel. It is worth noting impulsivity can affect a person's ability to access their working memory as well as alter their speech. In this debate, moderated by Wick TV, Erudite questions Fairy Queen at the mention of porn addiction not being real. A fairy queen appropriately and consistently appeals to the APA for her understanding of what is and is not an addiction, despite not so erudite egging her for her layman's opinion. To put it simply, fairy queen assertively states and defends her position, whereas not so erudite passive aggressively disagrees. 
Do you believe that, are you saying that porn addiction is not true? It's not real? I'm saying that at best it's a compulsion, at least according to the data that I've seen. So I've seen like something according to the World Health Organization, it is considered to be a disorder underneath the ISCDF. I can't pronounce, I don't remember what the acronym is, but it's a compulsion. It's not an addiction, at least according to what I've seen. And most of the data that I've seen refer to it as an addiction. Okay, it so say wh what do you think behavioral addictions are? I'm not sure what behavioral addictions are. All I can tell you is what the DSM says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Says gambling, is gambling an addiction to you? Do you think gambling is an addiction? I don't think it matters if gambling is an addiction to me. What matters is, is if you can be diagnosed okay. with it. According you you can say this. I'm going to re-ask you the question. Okay. Is gambling an addiction? I'm going to answer like, it depends on like what the professionals say. It, um, is, it, is it in the most them, then yeah. yeah, most professionals consider it an addiction. I want to know if you consider it an addiction. I think that's a, an absurd question to ask. It doesn't matter what yeah. I think. What matters is what the professionals say. Okay. Um, well, I'm talking to you. So I want to know what you think about it. And if you want to defer to the professionals, that's fine. I just want to hear you say I defer, to, I defer to what the APA says. Great. Okay. So the question is, in gambling, there's no, like, there's no physiological withdrawal. So how is it an addiction? I don't know. That's, something, that's a question for the APA. That's not a question for me. No, it's a question for you because you're saying that because pornography addiction is just based on compulsion, it's not an addiction. You're dubious about I'm that. Not, when it comes I'm, to I'm, most behavioral addictions, they're compulsive in nature, right? That's, yes. That's one of the I'm most important to elements to an addiction, it seems. The World Health Organization, it did not state it as an addiction. That's what the professionals have stated. And whether or not I think it's an addiction, I'm not in a position to know that because I'm not, in a life, I'm not a counselor. I don't know. All I can sure, tell okay. you... Do you All think I can tell that you there's that mixed data on this? Do you think some professionals might argue that it is an addiction, that there's sex addictions and stuff like that? I would agree that there are some. However, okay. they haven't made it into the DSM and they haven't been accepted for years. And I would also believe that behavioral many addictions are accepted for years. If you look in the DSM, you typically have behavioral specifiers that you can add to this thing. So I'm going to explain something to you now super calmly if you can let me. Not so erudite is not so coherent right now. I don't know why she is disagreeing with Fairy Queen about what is in the DSM. Fairy Queen is correct, and I don't know why she keeps dipping in and out of using the colloquial and technical terms for addiction. Just to be clear, colloquially, addiction means anything compulsively done. However, in psychology and in the DSM, addiction has additional meaning which requires it to be a standalone disorder. When Not So Erudite says behavior addictions have been accepted in the DSM for years, she is either uninformed or intentionally misleading Fairy Queen. To put it technically, all non-substance or behavioral compulsions have been and continue to be listed under other mental disorders. It wasn't until the DSM-5 that gambling disorder was added as the first standalone disorder labeled an addiction. This disorder is different from internet gambling disorder, which in the DSM-5 is not yet recognized as a disorder but is listed as a condition requiring further study. Just because a behavioral addiction is in the DSM does not mean it is recognized as an addiction, as a disorder, in the DSM or by the APA. Not so erudite has this not so infrequent habit of asserting herself as an expert, and in this case, an expert challenging authority, without holding herself to the burden of proof necessary to justify her posture. During the Dr. K discourse last year, when Chud Logic wanted to challenge Erudite's claim that Dr. K treats his patients well and has decent efficacy, she deferred to Harvard's reputation and set the bar appropriately high if Chud Logic wanted to challenge her appeal to authority. Um, I think a lot of people feel like I'm a big defender of, of Dr. K, which actually is ironic because all I've done is mostly critique critiques made against him. I'll be like, these aren't the greatest critiques, and I've levied critiques against him. That's literally, I think, all I've done. And I think I've said he's a good, he broadly seems to be like a decently solid psychiatrist who's well trained and seems to have decent efficacy with his clients. How do you, you know that, though? Oh, well, he's trained by Harvard and then was hired by Harvard. So, like, that's a pretty good uh, reference of, of skill by itself, I would say. I just, I just wonder if that's because you say you seem to suggest that you've got some insight into how he treats his clients. 
Uh, no, I, I would say uh, how we treat this client broadly. I would say like if Harvard has somebody hired to be training their future doctors, I would presume that they vetted him quite well to ensure that he treats his clients well and has decent efficacy and ethical practice with his clients. Okay. I just that's, just, that's just a standard of Harvard, I expect, right? And like maybe we can call Harvard into question then, but it's like, okay, well now we're like calling all of Harvard into question, which we could do. It's just that's a much larger claim. You need a lot more evidence to prove that, you know? Sure. It just, uh, yeah, it just seems like there's a lot of faith being put in just the, um, reputation of harvard um i mean what vetting would they do? I mean, you know i'm not trying to say like dr k bad in in terms of his private practice i'm putting that to yeah. one side but i just feel like appealing to harvard just because it's harvard and saying well you know they're a good university and they're going to do the vetting like do you have any insight into like how they vet people or anything along those lines i don't personally but i don't i don't work for harvard medicine right it, it, it's a bit of that like wanting to broadly trust authorities and like I, i'm all for also questioning the authorities um it's just like that becomes a pretty extraordinary claim. And so like with extraordinary claims, you just need extraordinary evidence. So if the evidence comes out that like Dr. K is a terrible practitioner, Harvard is actively hiring people without vetting them well, all this stuff, like if all this comes out, like that's really important to come out. I'm not opposed to that. It's just, you need, you need a large portion of evidence to prove that because there is kind of this historical precedent of Harvard being an Ivy League, high tier, high level of empiricism, um, uh, hospital and education center. Institutions that are trustworthy and trusted strengthen democracy. Anyone who supports democracy would not encourage a layperson to question their trust in institutions without reason. Let's see if Natsu Erudite holds herself to her own standards. Or if she, I don't know, just starts talking about addiction in technical terms, as if displaying her collegiate knowledge of the physiological effects of addiction is proof enough to appeal to her over the APA. So it's really important to understand that tegmental activation is important for any sort of compulsive type behavior. So tegmental okay. activation occurs in OCD, and it also occurs in all forms of addiction, which means that all forms of addiction, substance and behavioral, have a compulsive element to it. This is why when like addicts say something, for example, like, I couldn't not use, it's not impulsive, it's compulsive. It's like an itch they can't not scratch, right? And it seems to be the case that there's tegmental activation with things like porn and sex addiction gambling addiction as well because for us to understand how behaviors can be addicting it can't just be based off of physiological withdrawal and the compulsive model is one of the most dominant leading models because it has neuroscientific evidence for it so just to be clear i really don't want like people walking away with this thinking porn addiction isn't real it okay. seems like it is but it's not I like wanna... not so erudite is not so effective when she passive aggressively disagrees with fairy queen she should be able to assertively state her belief without challenging the knowledge or confidence Fairy Queen has in hers. If Erudite's goal is to have the panelists and audience walk away from the stream with a better understanding of what an addiction is in contrast to the DSM, she needed to explain how a disorder gets included in the DSM, not how addiction works. In order for a disorder to be included in the DSM, it must be peer-reviewed with empirical backing without much open controversy. Just because a disorder is not currently in the DSM does not mean it was never or can never be listed as a disorder. At the time the DSM-4 was finalized, there was some controversy and not enough research done into gambling, and thus it remained a compulsive behavior that is captured by other disorders. With more research and expert consensus, when they configured the DSM-5, gambling became the first non-substance addiction to be included as a disorder. With this knowledge and understanding, Not So Erudite could then explain to Fairy Queen that since the DSM-5 was published, further research has shown less controversy and more support in viewing porn addiction as a standalone disorder, and that these are strong indications that it will be included as such in the DSM-6. Unfortunately, Nato Erudite postures herself over others as an expert with the tone and smugness suggesting they do so as well, without any of the merit. The social reward that you get for holding Chud logic to your professional standards in debate when challenging institutions, you yourself are held to. So when you fail to justify why Fairy Queen should deviate from the APA, you look like a hypocrite. As the panel continues, not so erudite, who has been confusingly switching back and forth between colloquial and technical terms and definitions in this debate, ends up cutting off the moderator wick because she interprets his correctly applied colloquial use of the word compulsion to be a failed attempt at technical jargon. 
The way TV shows end on a cliffhanger before a commercial break to keep the viewer wanting more is very much intentional. Writers plan their episodes around breaks to keep their viewer engaging compulsively or in an exciting, irresistible way. In this clip I'm about to show you, Wick uses compulsive in this same way to describe this same goal of viewer retention used by live streamers. Unfortunately, Not So Erudite's earlier use of the word compulsion in its technical definition has removed her ability to understand the word outside of the DSM and then makes Wick the blame for her own confusion, resulting in a mass spread of confusion. Even in this, right, sex addiction, whether you believe it or not, gambling addiction, whether you believe it or not, streaming and OnlyFans both try to engage people to compulsively, right, um, check out your content, compulsively, right, uh, services, streaming services do this all the time. Like, we can look at Kick. For example, Kick allows gambling streams. Do we consider uh, a gambling stream to be exploitative? Okay, Would just because addiction thing? is compulsive in nature, it doesn't mean that people trying to hijack addiction centers are compul- like the behavior itself is inherently compulsive. So I don't want to like, I just want to be really clear about this language because now we're using like clinical words. Compulsive is a very specific thing, right? Watching gambling streams isn't about compulsivity, but gambling addictions is about compulsivity. Gambling okay. when they're doing gambling streamers, they're just trying to like be entertaining and be like as attention grabbing as possible. Okay, so I need to cut in on this because like, okay, this is on the APA's website. It was published in 2014. Okay. It references a very Please specific study that was done specifically with brain science, specifically related to pornography addiction. And what this person did, and I will read out exactly who this person is. This is Nicole Prowse, PhD researcher at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of South California, Los Angeles, and colleagues studied brain responses in people who have trouble regulating their porn consumption. What they wanted to find was they wanted to find is if their brains reacted to st- pornographic stimulus in the same way as looking at beer, in the same way as looking at heroin or any other form of addiction. And what they found was when they reviewed those brain scans, our findings do not make them look like addicts. This is on the APA's website. It's on 2014. The title of the article is Pornography Addictive. It was published by Kristen Weir in April 2014, volume 45, number four. I I believe you that it's real. The question is, can you just clarify the methodology? Because I don't have that study in front of me. Were the people that were looking at the porn only addicted to porn? or were they also addicted to beer and to heroin and stuff? Did they have like comorbid dis- addiction disorders? Um, okay, you, let you me find you. That's going to be super important, right? If you, no, like if I look at heroin, I'm not going to be like, oh no, my addiction centers are firing. That's not how this works. Everything about this debate was disappointing and needlessly condescending. Nazo Erudite relies on the idea of her education rather than any of the knowledge or critical thinking she should be able to apply from her education to communicate her beliefs. There's no reason Erudite should be impulsively grasping at ways to persuade Fairy Queen to disregard a study cited by the APA to explain why porn addiction is not listed as a disorder in the DSM-5. Nazo Erudite is disagreeable here to a fault. She uses indirectness and unqualified appeals against authority to get Fairy Queen to consider the DSM could be wrong in a way that undermines the APA. A competent, knowledgeable person would not want to convince someone to disregard the APA simply to suit their position in a debate. There is a coherent, informative approach not so erudite could have taken in this disagreement that I previously laid out, but unfortunately erudite is entirely debate-brained. Also worth noting, in the recent weeks since I have been vocal about my concerns with not-so-erudite dismissing criticism, she has since stated on Jay Stock's stream that she apologized to Fairy Queen for this debate. Zero comment or acknowledgement has been made as to what she did wrong, so I really can't understand um, or say what erudite has taken away from this performance, but that is her choice to make. Unfortunately for her, private apologies do not do much to absolve public hypocritical behavior. No, you don't. You you're uh, you're honestly red pilling me right now. <laughs> hey, I'm no, but, but seriously okay? though, it, the um swallow it. It's better.
I would, I, let me add one extra thing really quick. It, it's also stop making up new words and try to use the pre-existing ones that everybody has in their mind. Like when you talk to conservatives about shit, stop trying to throw in all this technical language. Use what they understand. And I'm going to say this straight. The left is just smarter than the right. The, the right is just more dumb. They just are. So stop trying to make them learn new to even come to the table and cater them to the to them a little bit. They need it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about the black pill. If there is one man who is an exception to the rule, he's short, unattractive, and pulls women just fine, then your whole rule is broken. Because if he can do that consistently, it means whatever he's doing, somebody else can replicate. And if he can do it, you can do it. <laughs> The black pill is a generalization that says women are shallow and will always pick the most attractive men if given the choice. They blame women's liberation for putting women in a position of making choices and then view their own lack of success in being chosen as a life sentence of involuntary celibacy. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about the black pill. If there is one man who is an exception to the rule, he's short, unattractive, and pulls women just fine, then your whole rule is broken. Because if he can do that consistently, it means whatever he's doing, somebody else can replicate. And if he can do it, you can do it. Unless you're going to tell me that there are just some men with magical cocks and magical ninjutsu who are able to convince women to love them despite their short, unattractive ways. You are wrong ontologically. The black pill is ontologically false. It is insane at every single level. It is so insanely false. <laughs> What not to worry Dites arguing is a straw man of the black pill. She's arguing against the specific proposition that all relationships are chosen by women solely on physical appearance. This would allow her to use deductive reasoning, which would only require her to show you one short, unattractive man that consistently finds success with women to disprove it. How do these exist? No, stop. Stop and listen. Can everyone be a destiny? Yes, because you... Everyone can be a destiny because it, not everyone can be destiny, but every single person can look at the skills that destiny is bringing to the table. Here's a more important thing. Destiny exists, sure, but here's the problem. My husband exists. He was slaying women as a 5'6 high school dropout. And this was before he was like, all he did is he looks maxed and got really good at charisma. And he did it consistently. The fact that Nick exists at all means that you I are wrong. You if Nick exists and is consistently pulling above his level, that means anyone can replicate it. If an exception exists, and it is consistently existing, anyone, you can look at what he's doing, okay? If you have a rule that the world is this way, that to uh, achieve getting women, you must be this way, but one guy breaks the rule, and he breaks it consistently, all you need to do is look at what that guy does and then replicate it. And I'm really serious, unless you're telling me that he can do magic, and therefore he is non-replicable, you're just capping. You're just capping. I'm sorry. I'm not saying it's easy. Before anyone fucking stuck, shoved words in my mouth, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying you're wrong. I'm saying you're wrong. If you're short, you're doomed. You're just not. Nick is 5'6", and he's always pulled. Nick isn't an 8. He's just not an 8. I'm sorry. And he wasn't as buff as he was when he was pulling women. He was a high school dropout. <laughs> I'm not really sure why Kyla throws Destiny and her husband Nick under the bus like this. Neither of them would be regarded as physically unattractive, but that's not her worst offense here. In an attempt to intellectualize the black pill, Kyla confuses her chat by her incorrect application of logic. Deductive reasoning cannot be applied to disprove a generalization. What erudite disproved was a proposition she incorrectly presented as the black pill. The actual black pill is a generalization, and if Kyla intended on using logic to disprove it, she would have needed to apply inductive reasoning rather than deductive. Unfortunately, she never comes to that realization as she instead decides on attacking her chat. <laughs> I'm not assuming anything, Callum. I don't think ninjutsu, genjutsu, and magic exists. Do you? Because the unique thing is called social skills. Are you going to tell me that you can't replicate social skills? Really? Not at all? Just no way? Fucking capping. Fucking capping. Shit drives me crazy. Read a book. Specifically, read this book. Read 
Scout mindset. By Julia Galef. Please, for the love of God, I beg you, Callum. Read it. Because you're wrong here. You're wrong. You're ontologically wrong. This is like, this is fucking math that I'm explaining to you right now. I, I don't know if you don't understand. You obviously don't understand this. This is, this is mathematical. If there is an exception to a hard rule that can be replicated, the rule doesn't matter. The rule is busted. This is how fucking science works, bitch. If I say the world must be this way, and then I consistently find something that all the time breaks that rule, all I need to do is analyze what's going on in that situation and replicate it. And if I can get the same result, which is breaking the rule, then the rule never existed. It was wrong. My point is that you're not making a valid claim at its core, but again, I respect your time. We can touch base later. You're not making a valid claim at its core. Oh man, bro. <sighs> Maybe you're just heated. I'll just grab that you're heated. I, uh, I'm sorry. Take a, take a basic philosophy course. I don't even know what to do anymore. I don't, I don't know what to say. I, I hate that answer. Like, go educate yourself. But like, I don't know what else to say. I think it's just not clicking for you. Like, you are you are demonstrably wrong. Oh, when people are so wrong and so dumb and they're smug about it, I just clean. We saw your. I just wanna. I just wanna kill something. You can't be dumb and wrong and smug about it. It's so cringe. It's so cringe. Oh, it's so cringe. It's funny to see not to erudite understand how fucking frustrating it is to see someone so wrong be so smug. You don't know math while well, I'm explaining like a foundational <laughs> logical premise. Like it's just like, <sighs> oh my god. <laughs> You're very conceited. I'm not. I'm so. I'm not. That's like saying. That's like if I was being like, no, I promise you, two plus two is four. And you're like, I'm pretty sure it's five, though. And I'm like, it's not. It's four. And you're like, God, why would you get so angry at me? It's obviously five. And I'm like, it's not. And then I like explain. I'm like, the reason it's not five is because here, count. Okay. So when you have one and then another one, so that's two, and you count two more. And so then, and then you add two, right? So one, two, and then you add two more, three, four, and then you put those together, and that equals four. And you're like, I'm just not getting it. I just, it's pretty stupid of you to say. And I'm like, no, you're stupid. At some point, I get to call you stupid, okay? That doesn't make me conceited just because you don't understand that two plus two equals four, not five. Here's the shit. If I take the time to patiently explain a concept to you like 18 times in a row, and you're like, well, she's conceited because she's not acknowledging that she could be wrong. It's like, why would I? Two plus two is four. Why would I acknowledge that I'm wrong? That I could be wrong. What do you mean? Do you want me to say, okay, yes, theoretically in some other multiverse, it could exist that numbers exist in a different way that we can't even conceive of. And in that multiverse that exists, two plus two could theoretically equal five. I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't know in what, in what way that would ever work, but it's possible that there are things outside my imagination. It's like, is that what I have to say to you? <laughs> She's wrong. Cope, cope, cope. Good job, Jail. If Nick's power is charisma, it can't be replicated. It's like saying someone's comedic talents can be replicated. Yes. It can be. This is why comedians mentor each other. <laughs> what do you think dating with fire, playing with fire does? He's basically a charisma coach. I have been showing you all videos of him trying to pick up women and him being turned down. The women that he has on his show, he either pays them or he promotes his channel, which is basically dead, and says, this is a channel. You can promote your OnlyFans, you can promote your Instagram, you can promote this, this, this and women are going to, to take the bait. Yeah, you're right. Nick is particular is probably like in the top 90, 90th percentile for charisma. You don't need to be. If you look smacked a little bit and you figure out how to like have a couple of like decent characteristics about like be a decently nice person, and then you just improve your social skills, you don't need to be Dave Chappelle. You just need to be like not where you are now, clearly. Like clearly. Because you would be black belt if you had these charisma skills, I, I promise you. You just need to be better than you are now. That's it. <laughs> The chat eventually gets Kyla to consider the difficulty in replicating charisma, but by that point, Erudite had given up and instead turned to mock her chat for, well, giving up. Most stream chats are comprised mostly of men, so it's not odd that a female streamer would at times struggle to relate to their chat if they were discussing men's issues. Not so erudite, however, built her platform on TikTok and then Twitch debating and advocating on behalf of men. Unfortunately, not so erudite makes the not so fortunate mistake of misunderstanding and misrepresenting the issues many men are struggling with today. If this was a video to give advice, I'd say don't be smug or stupid. Just be better than you are now or than you are here. <laughs> This is rich. Okay, now that I've dismantled all of your arguments, the best you have now is 
This is rich. I'm not a black pill. I'm not a black pill, but I don't think social skills can be taught. Okay. I don't know, man. I guess if you think it's that hard, life sucks and then you die. Like if you're desperately dedicated to just convincing yourself that life sucks and there's no hope for you, okay. I'm not gonna fight for you. You don't you don't want it. But if you ever do change your mind, you know where I am. Now you're all too scared to say what you're thinking. You're a victim. Fuck that. I cancel cancel culture. Don't listen to these bitches watch. I can handle vultures. It's not what you said. It's not even your position. It's the way you are saying it. As I said, if you if you said Max, I think you have a I think you have a serious problem here. I'm worried about you. I think your relationship is abusive. I think some I think bad stuff's going on and I want to try to help you. That would I don't want to help you though. That's not my goal. I know. I know. But do you see how you're now changing the subject, but if we go back to the subject we were just talking about, you no, can see how... No, the difference is you engage... Can you guys just shut the facts. fuck up and no, stop interrupting no, no, no. me? For the, I literally I, can't... I, no, I don't, no, no, I don't, no, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, I can't talk about this with... I, I need Erudite. I need you to leave, or I need you to let me finish talking when I'm talking. Mr. Girl and Destiny, who we'll refer to as Max and Steven, had interesting conversations to observe from a distance. A lot of people believed Steven's goals in these conversations was simply to farm people like Max because they make for good content. At the time, Steven wanted to develop more as a person and that drive for autonomous growth can come with an appreciation for others who look to be on similar but unique paths. Steven would describe these people as interesting, others describe them as mentally ill. Earlier, I mentioned Dabrowski's theory of positive disintegration for the level memes, but there is something to the theory that can explain why people like Max and others with mental illness are so interesting. Over the decades, psychologists have studied human development and identified traits, like intensity, that can often be indicators of a personality disorder and linked those to the potential for higher advancement in human development. The most interesting people are intense. They have a gift, a drive, an overexcitement that can't be plagiarized. And when paired with intelligence and creativity, they create the cliches that inauthentic people latch onto and hide behind. Max, despite how I personally feel about him, was a very interesting and authentic person. In this stream, he is aiming to resolve interpersonal conflict between him and Steven regarding how Steven had been speaking publicly about Max's relationship with his girlfriend Shaylin. I personally view Max and Shaylin's relationship as mutually emotionally abusive, but most of the internet at this time regarded Max to be the only, or at least the more, abusive one of the two because of the provocative content he put out giving insight to the private intimate arguments they would have. Max and Steven agreed for Not So Erudite to moderate their conversation, but after about an hour, Max starts to vocalize his concern that Not So Erudite is not so neutral. I need you to stop. Um, so just to be clear, none of this is like on me. So I'd appreciate like this like no, hard. No, I'm talking. I want you to me. shut the fuck up. I want right, you both to shut Max the fuck up. But the problem is that up. you're talking about seventy percent of the time in no, any it's, time. No, that's not even true. Yes, I want. Yes, I want. Yes. To... Yes. yes. This one-to-one -one dialogue you've had okay. with Stephen, you have unequivocally talked. I understand. The most. I understand. I want to finish saying what I'm saying, and then you can respond. Does that work for you? Can you say it in two sentences? Probably not. Can you try? Say sure. it in two sentences. I'll try. I'll try. Okay. But I need you guys to both let me finish what I'm saying. Um, because the tag team dynamic is really fucking irritating. I've been very, very neutral almost the I whole time. Just, and I just said that I don't think that's true. So saying the opposite of what I said is not really an yeah, argument. She would I understand. You don't, right. Nobody thinks they're tag teaming somebody. I know you don't think you're doing that. That's just what I think. To break this down, Max is hurt that Steven spoke about Max and Shaylin's relationship in a way he feels added to the public perception that Max was the sole abuser in his relationship. Steven, however has a lot of plausible deniability to Max's claim due to his indirectness, which is the difference between him saying, Max sounds like an abusive boyfriend, and does Max let Shaylin have a cell phone? To put it simply, at this time, Stephen does think Max is abusive, but he does not feel comfortable or confident enough to directly say as much, 
because he didn't have enough evidence to support such a direct statement if it did initiate conflict. And in his experience, everything initiates conflict. As an online debater, obviously, Stephen is not what comes to mind when people think of someone who is conflict avoidant. But when it comes to interpersonal conflict, he demonstrates a different degree of comfort with conflict and will often avoid directly engaging. Max and Stephen, I think, have a good understanding of each other and this conflict they are discussing here. Max is hiking uphill to prove conflict was initiated by Stephen, and Stephen is trotting downhill behind his indirectness. In my opinion, they are both wrong, and so I'm already bored. But things get more interesting when the moderator, not so erudite, takes an already uphill battle for Max and adds an avalanche. Let's go back and pay attention to what Max is actually asking of Stephen. It's not what you said. It's not even your position. It's the way you are saying it. As I said, if you if you said Max, I think you have a I think you have a serious problem here. I'm worried about you. I think your relationship is abusive. I think some I think bad stuff's going on, and I want to try to help you. That would I don't want to help you though. That's not my goal. I know. I know. But do you see how you're now changing the subject? But if we go back to the subject we were just talking about, you can and ignore this part. Steven, you're changing the subject. You're changing the subject from the way you're saying something to what you're saying. I'm saying you could condemn me. Your position could be that I'm absolutely incredibly abusive, but you could still present that and talk about that in a way that is warm and non-condemning. And your position can be that I'm kind of maybe abusive and you can present that in a way that is extremely condemning. You did the second one. So when you say, oh, you just don't, you want me to hide what I think. I'm not saying I want you to hide what you think or that you should. I'm saying there's the way I would talk about an abuse, you punching Melina in in the face. I would certainly condemn your behavior, but I would do it in a way that didn't fuck you over. Again, I think Max and Steven have a good understanding of each other here. They just both view themselves as way more cunning and selfless than they are. Both of these streamers are very self-preserving, and honestly, they should stay that way, because they are both very hard to empathize with and have compassion for. And I would also like to respond to the other thing you said, is that I, I feel uncomfortable. It's not to protect you so much as protect me. I feel uncomfortable being in the position of talking about somebody with their partner in front of thousands of people. I'm not Is that a boundary that you have with Steven, that you don't want him to talk about your relationship when she's not there? Is that a boundary no, that you're asking not, for? That's no. So I'm why not are you comparing your interpersonal style to he his? just, again, this is the tag team thing. Steven said, wait. No. I'm asking you Yes, now. no, I want to explain why I said that because now you're asking me why I'm saying it. Steven, yeah. sa- Steven said that if he applies the same logic that I used with the kid gloves thing, then it implies it's a horrible thing for me to say, I don't want to talk about you with your wife behind your back. And I'm saying... That's no, those are different. And I want to explain why they're different. The reason is it's not, I'm not saying that there's some terrible thing that would come out about you or that she would say something terrible about you. I'm saying that it is a, I feel like inherently fucks you over the fact that I'm talking about you with your partner in public when you're not there to represent yourself. I don't feel comfortable doing that because I think it's wrong, but you asshole want to you, Steven want to interview Shaylin uh, about a a conversation where you're going to fuck me and you're going to fuck me in the interview with her. You're going to do the same fucking underhanded cold thing and try to make me look as bad as possible. And you're going to- Do you think you're interpersonally better at relations than Steven is? Do you think your interpersonal style, the boundaries, the way that you try to protect the people that you love is overall better than Steven's? Anyone else reading way too deep into Max and Steven testing each other's friendship with how much they can pry through conversations with the other's partners that could reveal very one-sidedly unflattering ideas about their friend, you know, if those conversations were to be had with no empathic concern for the subject of scrutiny? Me neither. I was literally on the same page as Not So Erudite just thinking, If I wanted to moderate and keep this conversation fair and on track, right now would be the perfect time to cut off Max 
and ask if he thinks he's better than Steven at friendships. Okay, hold on. Let me not be so indirect. Keep in mind that at this time in Steven's career, he is on a building friendships arc, almost initiated by Not So Erudite. So the idea that she would even wait a question that implies Steven is good at maintaining friendships is just willful ignorance. But Max engages with her question nonetheless, and manages to entirely avoid the bait of comparing his ability to Stevens. That does not, however, stop Not So Erudite from continuing to dismiss Max's concerns while Steven gleefully plays video games. Um, I think there are, no, overall, I don't know, but I think there are certain things not even better it's just it's just what works better for me like if if you don't if you if you don't like certain things or you don't want certain things then the way you live is better for you I, but then so, why don't you just tell steven what your boundaries are and then steven gets to decide whether or not he's willing to work within them i did i set a boundary i said i don't want i said shaylin is not gonna come on stream i'm not gonna have her on right uh, no, you know, you know, me saying she's not going to come on stream and I want to protect her from the chat. If the next thing, if five minutes later you say, is it true that you don't let her have a phone? I don't know if that is totally respecting my boundary. I think that you kind of fucked it's me over a little bit. Unrelated. Did he respect uh, your You boundary? may think it's completely unrelated, but boundary. I don't think it is. Did he respect your boundary? <laughs> An effective mediator who is interested in Stephen maintaining his friendship would not add to his indirectness by speaking and objecting on his behalf. Avoiding being clear and direct with Max is what has gotten Stephen in this situation. And the way Not So Erudite jumps to aid him makes that indirectness feel more aggressive. Not So Erudite feels like an attack dog, but she's not. She's just very aware of how uncomfortable accountability is and doing a really good job of trying to help Stephen avoid it. Did he respect uh, You your may think it's completely unrelated, but boundary. I don't think it is. Did he respect your boundary about not bringing Shaylin on stream? Is that correct? Okay, if I ask my coworker... No, answer office, the question. Don't weasel out. Answer the question. I already said no. It's not respecting my boundary. No. How not? I, I'm explaining it. Yeah, I'm going to lead this conversation now because you're being a baby. So I'm going to help you out here. So okay. tell us now why that wasn't respecting your boundary. Your boundary was isn't Shaylin can't true, come on stream. Isn't it true that little kids insult each other by calling each other? So are you telling me that you stated a boundary and behind the boundary was a second secret one that you didn't tell him about and no. Stephen actually crossed this one? Well, he no. didn't cross the boundary that you he stated. Did. If he you did. wanted a different boundary, he, I, you should wait, have said it. I didn't say he crossed it. I said he didn't respect it. What's the difference? I'll tell you. If I ask a coworker on a date and she says no... And I say, oh, okay, well, I accept your answer is no. And then I go to the lounge and I say, Sarah's pussy stanks as loud as I can. While I would be technically not crossing her boundary, not forcing her to go on a date with me, I'm not exactly respecting it either. They're wholly different boundaries. The first boundary is I don't want to go a on a date with you. And then there's a lot of social convention boundaries as well. For example, typically when people say, no, I don't want to go on a date with you, while that's unrelated to what you stated, most people also don't want people making loud co like Absolutely. negative comments about their there's another. Public. There's also another there boundary different that is crossing. Boundaries. Well, I, do different you... boundaries. Okay. Do you so understand I, so, that? Well, okay. So in my mind, if the two behaviors are linked to one another, then the person would probably feel like their sexual boundaries about saying no to the date were also not being respected because they're saying, well, well if I say no to a date, then somebody no. yells about my... Put well, they this would is have just felt that a different That's boundary was crossed. Okay. They would have been like, yeah, he didn't force me to go on a date, but That's then he just, did okay. say really well, creepy I'm stuff about you, my vagina, I'm, okay. I'm telling which you is how typically an implied boundary, right? There's this some is, social contracts that we work with. Yes, I get, and one social I get, contract yes, is I get probably don't perception. loudly say shit about people's genitals. It's, it's really These are separate to, boundaries. It's, one it's of them is really, implicit and one of them is explicit. It's really hard to argue. You didn't respect the implicit one. It's really hard to argue that two things aren't connected. So you can just say that I'm wrong for connecting them, but that is how I feel. I'm not saying that they're unrelated. I'm saying they're two separate boundaries. And what you're saying to Stephen is this was my boundary and you didn't respect it. But yes. he did. He didn't respect your implicit boundary that was connected to I that. I know. I know. We we both clear are clear on where the other person is. And I have no, no further comment about this. <laughs>
I am also going to have no comment about Nato Erudite's flawed understanding and application of boundaries right now. We will discuss her superiority complex and manipulative communication style in another video. This video is about hypocrisy. And right now, Stephen is finally going to speak. Surely, he will make a direct statement and not just ask a question Max has already provided the answer for and then laugh when Nato Erudite cuts in to declare everything to be Max's fault because Stephen is a retarded child. I mean, not a mind reader. Stephen is not a mind reader. Yeah, for all the implicitness, then, am I, so do I just, am I not supposed to bring up anything related to Shaylin ever? Just so I can understand. No. I like talking about Shaylin with you, actually. So this is the issue, right? Is this boundary? It makes you feel, it makes it feel like you're and part Max, of the family. Your whole you know? shtick is that you're explicit and you say things that people don't say, which means you say the implicit stuff. That's so not a shtick. Steven, it's, it's called a personality. Steven not understanding that there was also an implicit boundary attached to that is only your fault for not expressing that. That is your responsibility exclusively. You can be mad that he didn't respect it, if but Steven, there's no way if, he could have okay, mind read if that Steven, that If Steven doesn't understand that asking somebody if they allow their girlfriend to use a phone could potentially start a harmful rumor about them that they don't allow their girlfriend to use a phone, then I think he needs to read some Internet 101. But I suspect that he does understand well, I, I would that make the just same statement look... about you that when you have videos that outwardly to any normal human being would look like this could be really abusive, and then you make an utterance saying like, no, I want to protect her from evil things online, and I, you're, I think you even knowingly made that statement, knowing it sounds a little bit dicey, you can't be surprised when the question comes up. Like, How would you have said it? Well, I mean, I probably would have said the same thing, but I wouldn't be upset when somebody would ask me for clarification otherwise. Oh, so when I'd you say, course. when you say, hey, I heard you don't let your girlfriend have a phone. You're just asking for clarification. I didn't say it. I think I just asked asking you questions it. with destiny, everybody. The problem with you that's saying that's not a fair representation of what Stephen did. And I think you like you like Stephen and know Stephen well enough that you should be charitable to your friend in this situation, right? You've already said that you don't. Oh, think he's I'm being hyper charitable. You are not. Oh, and you know oh this man, are. this oh, is I'm at, I'm at one percent. I'm at one no. percent here. If Max wasn't charitable here. He would not have been able to express an imagined way that Stephen could question Max's judgment or behavior publicly that Max would feel okay with. Mnatsu Erudite has done a good job of ignoring every indication of desired and attempted communication and resolution by Max, and instead focuses on invalidating Max's ability to feel hurt by Stephen's behavior. She is the worst faith actor in this call, and this isn't even her final form. It would have worked again. I don't think it's well I don't think because you say the most outlandish things, Max. I don't think he's intentionally trying to interrogate me. I just think that the setup of the conversation. Oh, no, you way. feel interrogated, which is wholly different than anything that actually happened. And the okay. reality is, Max, that just because you feel some way about anything, you're no, a gish gallop, and you're changing the I subject. Mute you. I was saying something. I will else. keep talking. If you, but you just don't like one word telling I people, this is how I feel, and then chill. projecting that world onto the landscape of everyone oh God, else, the reality is you will always get Brittany in here. wrong. You will always be wrong, because the reality is that how you feel isn't always true. He didn't interrogate you. You felt interrogated. Those I, are different okay. things. Great. And then to put on you Stephen the responsibility say, say that of how you, disagree. you feel is Tyler. precisely oppositional to the thing that you constantly okay. advocate for, which yes. is that people should have to carry each other emotionally. And you make okay. Stephen do it for you all the time and you've been making him do it and you've been making me do it because you aren't willing to regulate you aren't willing to manage yourself all you want to do is feel how you feel and then project that onto other people it's cowardly it's pathetic and you need to stop doing it or you are going to continue damaging your relationships online probably not with steven because he doesn't fucking care about shit like this but oh this absolutely is he does is you're constantly projecting onto people and Steven's being like, yeah, you're fucking wrong and you'll never move anywhere because you'll never believe anyone because you're so fucking convinced that all your feelings are true because they feel really big that you're never willing to hear anyone else. And that's the problem with this interpersonal dynamic is you're basically telling Steven he has to engage like you do with other people, which is unfair. It basically tells Steven that he doesn't get to be who he is in relationship with you. You won't accept that. He you has to be ideal version that you have painted for what you would like ideally what precisely you would do and that's oh. a shitty thing to do to your friends and you need to stop doing it to steve not so erudite is telling max his feelings are not valid 
If he were less emotional right now, he would be able to see that, but he can't and he won't listen to reason. All of which turn out to be not so erudite's problem as a biased moderator. We need to stop doing it to Steve. I think that your dual role in this conversation is causing problems. Are you the moderator or are you doing something else? I think she, I became the moderator. Now. Okay. She's a girl uh, boss thing. Yeah, oh, I feel like yeah, I feel like uh, if you want the power to ask questions and stop us from interrupting each other and stuff, I feel like you should not. Um... I don't need any recommendations from you about how I should or should not engage in this conversation. I feel completely okay. comfortable with it, and if it isn't good, I'll talk to people that I respect about it. Okay. Man, there's a lot of vitriol in, in this room right now, going <laughs> in all directions. Well, none is coming from me actually, because I'm chill. But you guys, of course, <laughs> yes. You guys are yes. both something else. Notice how I say that I'm chill, even though I'm not, but then it like puts it in the viewer's mind that I am, and now you. Can <laughs> I did notice that. Thank you for pointing it out. Yeah. Thank you for pointing it out. Um. Uh. Yeah. So. Not so erudite emotionally responds to Max's reasonable request for unbiased moderation by refusing to consider his concerns or change her behavior. It isn't until Stephen indirectly criticizes Not So Erudite by mocking her failed attempt to present herself as emotionally regulated and in control that she decides to take a step back. If Not So Erudite was present and putting in a genuine effort to neutrally moderate Max and Stephen's interpersonal conflict, she would have been able to understand from Max's expressed feelings how hurtful something like indirectly being mocked for your failure or vulnerability could be coming from a friend without having to experience it herself from Stephen in this debate. In this conversation, Nato Erudite was a poor listener, an obfuscator, an ineffective mediator, and entirely too aggressive. At Max's first expressed concern that Nato Erudite was moderating one-sidedly, Nato Erudite put her own desire above that of being a just moderator. Like a fraud, she declared herself neutral while behaving as anything but. So just to be clear, a person who informs on an organization engaged in illicit activity is technically a whistleblower. No, by that's the a definition. reporter. Oh, that would be okay. like saying Glenn Gre Greenwald is a whistleblower because he reported on Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden's a whistleblower. Edward Snowden is a whistleblower, exactly. But Wait, that hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't know how you guys that. are all missing the critical definition. So a whistleblower is usually somebody that is part of the organization that they're informing right. on. That's what a whistleblower is. So, yes. for instance, Alex Jones is connected to people that are ostensibly whistleblowers, where they don't exist, I'm not sure. But like the but whistleblower is a person that comes from an organization, and then they report about that organization, essentially. That's a whistle whistleblower. And <laughs> on this political episode of Destiny's Keep or Kick game show, co-hosted by Carantos, not so erudite beats out the other six political streamers, despite to this day still not understanding what a whistleblower is. Prior to this panel, a former Air Force intelligence officer testified before a House Oversight Subcommittee that the United States is concealing a program for multiple decades that retrieves and studies UAPs, once known as UFOs. Not much is controversial or interesting about this news beyond the idea of aliens existing. Even though Hollywood has already romanticized the idea of aliens in our minds for decades, I think if people discovered aliens were living among us, it would give us a lot more answers than it would questions. It could explain who is still living in Canada, for example. Despite how dead this topic is, somehow the panel found something to fight over. Let's rewind a bit and see how things escalated to here. People this want to is focus so on the fucking a whistleblower. President. This is a whistleblower about the military complex, which both sides of the party, to some degree, would have relationships with, and yep. would also want to be protecting to some degree, according to your conspiracy theory. So the idea that like this whistleblower is cool and base to lefties because there's like some weird political dunk. The reason why people think it's cool is because we're talking about fucking aliens, and it's exciting no, that maybe feet. after the invention of AI, maybe we've got aliens too. That's did why you it's listen? Did you listen to what he said? He said it's making talking about whistleblowers he wasn't just saying aliens he was saying the idea of whistleblowers in general he's glad that that's being well brought up. rob the I whistleblowers that you don't erudite keep it up so the whistleblowers the, a... that the... go ahead erudite i'm sorry i was just gonna say there's a really big difference between some of the whistleblowers that lefties roll their eye at. and in fairness i think lefties roll their eyes at too many whistleblowers on the right that they shouldn't have right like epstein was real and we gotta fucking deal with that 
right? We have to think about that. And he probably, well, let's There's most blowers at the left champions, like Snowden, yes, Chelsea Manning. There are, there are, right? It just tends to be like, A, we tend to like whistleblowers that have lots of credentials behind their name, which this guy does, right? He's very high up, so he seems more reputable. Versus like, if there's whistleblowers that happen to be like, they live in their parents' basement and they're crazy and they've like been selling snake oil for 15 years. And now they're talking about how like Hunter Biden's dick is actually personally responsible for the Russian invasion of Ukraine because Russia just yes. really wants one. Hunter Biden's dick. Put, That's going to be an issue, right? Which one was exactly. that? Was that uh, Shapley at the IRS or was that Ziegler, you know, the gay Democrat? Which one was that? Uh, there was, can, can um, I think that? it was the, that was the, the arms dealer that's that. on the run. She's probably talking about the arms dealer that's on the run right uh, the now. Business contact of, uh, the business contact of Hunter Biden, that guy? Okay, okay. For the autism, yeah. the Hunter Biden dick joke was a joke. I don't actually think don't Hunter know. Biden's dick is personally responsible for the war in Russia. Nor I do I think anyone is saying that. Nor do I think anyone is saying that. Saying that. Don't explain your joke. It makes it less funny. It wasn't I'm that funny to, in the first no, place. But try me, not to autistically okay. fight with the joke afterwards. And no, what I was fighting with was the straw manning of like, well, we like whistleblowers that are credentialed. My question to you is, which I didn't say that. I just didn't say that. You literally did. You said whistleblowers that have heavy credentials like this alien guy, we like him. But people that live in their mom's basement and dick joke. And I was asking you, can you name me the whistleblower that's like that? <laughs> Good on Rob Knorr for being able to recall one minute back in the discussion. Let's rewind though and listen back just to make sure. Be like A, we tend to like whistleblowers that have lots of credentials behind their name, which this guy does, right? He's very high up, so he seems more reputable. Versus like if there's whistleblowers that happen to be like they live in their parents' basement and they're crazy and they've like been selling snake oil for 15 years, and now they're talking about how like Hunter Biden's dick is actually personally responsible for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, I don't know why not so erudite said this. It doesn't exactly make sense the image of an unemployed whistleblower or a scam artist whistleblower unless the scammer is outing themselves surely not so erudite made a mistake it happens to the best of us there are a couple solid progressive political content creators on the panel so i'm sure one of them will help or bail her out <laughs> You literally did. You said whistleblowers that have heavy credentials like this alien guy, we like him, but people that live in their mom's basement and dick joke. And I was asking you, can you name me the whistleblower that's like that? Name me the whistleblower that you think is uncredentialed. That's what I was getting to. To be honest, I'm not super in on all of your right wing whistleblowers. So I'm sure that among the, the be a people that you're going to list. Oh, I am. I'm it could sure be a left wing one. whistleblower. Go ahead. Name me the one you're referring. You're clearly referring to some whistleblowers are just incredible. I'm just asking you for an example. Give me an example. I'll be talking about Gal okay. Luft, the guy Alex who's Alex Jones the, the... is a much less credible a whistleblower. whistleblower. Yes, he is. How's he a whistleblower? Okay, never mind. I'm really important. Was about to bail Not So Airy Day out, but instead she names Alex Jones, who is neither living in his parents' basement or a whistleblower. Okay. He's a whistleblower in the fact that he is like most dominant for spreading conspiracy theories and talking about them. In fact, he was charged for spreading the conspiracy theory about Sandy Hook. And I would say in general, even though he was right about Epstein, and it's a little weird to think about Alex Jones being right about some of these things. He's also been really fucking wrong about a lot of things that he's been whistleblowing on, like the Sandy Hook case that's gotten I, getting. Him I, I don't think that's a whistleblower. With the word whistleblower. Why, why would Alex Jones be a whistleblower? He's just a conspiracy theorist. What are you talking about? Okay. Whistleblowers are specific. No, what do you, uh, what do you mean? What is like, how is Alex Jones a whistleblower? Wait, hold, on, hold on, Rob. You're right. Like, argue your point. How is Alex Jones, Alex Jones a whistleblower? Go ahead. Okay, here. I'll give you an example of a basement dwelling instead so that we can like, yes, get I'm off the on. Get in Wikipedia. Here we go. The Discord leaker in the Air Force was literally a basement dwelling. It's just some random Okay, cool, but how is Alex Jones a whistleblower? <laughs> Okay, Alex Jones claimed tons of his info came from inside sources. That doesn't make him a whistleblower. That's not a whistleblower. That just makes he's a conspiracy theorist. That means he asserted something without evidence. It's cool. <laughs> like, Holy but shit. Why would he be a whistleblower? Let's say according to him, according to him, his sources came from inside the government. I'm sorry. And why would you actually... take Alex Jones at his word? Why? Okay. Uh, first of all, Aaron, keep up. I'm not taking Meta's word. I think he's a whistleblower in the fact that he's making up conspiracy theories and he tries to portray okay, himself as a no, whistleblower. No, exactly. He's, that, he he's making up conspiracy these... theories. He doesn't, you don't need to call him a whistleblower. You can just get rid of that part. Wait, okay, we're doing word games. Do you agree yeah. that Alex Jones 
Jones is a credible source of information from inside the government, Aaron. Do you think that Alex Jones is a good source? No. Do you think that he has popularized lots of inside source conspiracies from within the government on his show? I'm going to answer yes all these questions and so we'll make him a whistleblower. What has he blown the whistle on? Right. What you're describing, Aaron Dykes, a reporter, right? Reporters listen to whistleblowers and then say someone from inside the government, that okay, might fine. be a whistleblower, told me. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, sure, I'm going to broaden it to the fact that, you know what? Lifties in general don't listen to anyone who plop popularizes ideas that spread all over. So just to be clear, a person who informs on an organization engaged in illicit activity is technically a whistleblower. No, by that's the a reporter. Oh, that would be like saying Glenn Gre Greenwald is a whistleblower because he reported on Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden's a whistleblower. Edward Snowden is a whistleblower, exactly. But Wait, that hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't know how you guys that. are all missing the critical definition. So a whistleblower is usually somebody that is part of the organization that they're informing right. on. That's what a whistleblower is. So, yes. for instance, Alex Jones is connected to people that are ostensibly whistleblowers, where they don't exist, I'm not sure. But like the but whistleblower is a person that comes from an organization, and then they report about that organization, essentially. That's a whistleblower. And not only is Alex Jones not a whistleblower, he also isn't who anyone should credit for breaking the sex trafficking story surrounding Jeffrey Epstein. According to Reddit historians, despite Alex Jones's claims of discussing Epstein since 2008, the furthest back he can be cited mentioning Epstein was January 2nd, 2015, where Jones misspoke Epstein's name while reading a story in the news stating the U.S. District Court in Southern Florida ordered to strike rape accusations made against Britain's Prince Andrew from court records. There are several investigative journalists and police officers regarded as contributing to unraveling the truth around Epstein, none of which are named Alex Jones. Straightraid and Rob Knorr are correct here. Alex Jones, even if he was reporting on information given to him from government employees, would still not be regarded as a whistleblower. He would be someone reporting on information released from a whistleblower. There is no broader definition Erudite can defer to in order to save face and avoid admitting she doesn't know what she is talking about. Everyone on the panel except for not so Erudite understands this. Yet, for some reason, Destiny implies all of the panel is missing the part where a whistleblower is someone from within the organization they are informing on. It's just erudite, Stephen. But maybe if it comes gently from you without singling her out, she'll be more receptive to it. I see what we're doing. Whistleblower. And there are legal protections for that legal definition of if you're in the okay. FBI and blow the whistle. Nonetheless, let me white knight and sure. save erudite and go you over. You don't need to, I'm actually. You don't need to. I'm going to use the me. word, I'm going to use the word, hold on, hold on, I'm going to bypass the autism. I'm going to use the word blah, 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 blah to reference people who popularize ideas. That you don't have to do that, you just don't have to call Alex Jones a whistleblower. I don't care, I don't care about your autism. Take care. The, I'm going to no. use the word blah, 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 blah. No. Just concede no. on it, just concede no. on that point, he's not a whistleblower. I, I literally am, I don't care. Don't Take the L, that. you lost that argument, no big deal, it's not big in the grand scheme of things. Hold on, yes, hold on. Okay, keep Fine. digging the hole. I'm cool sure. with it. Hold on. He's not a whistleblower. Can we go back to the yes. actual point yes, of the conversation? Yes, that's what we were trying to do. Thank okay. you for admitting that after five minutes of wasting our time. It's starting to seem like the heat of debate isn't really the cause of rigidity for a not-so-erudite, because there were several moments at which she could have backed off, either by letting I'm Really Important respond to Rob initially, after he had mentioned several times that he knew of all of the whistleblowers, she could have allowed Straight Ray to correct her, understanding that they are both progressives if being corrected by Rob is less palatable. Or she could have taken Destiny's helping hand at his interjection to declare everyone to be wrong. Nato Erudite was not looking for a way out. Despite everyone on the panel trying to help or trying to correct her, she instead decided to talk down to everyone in a child's voice declaring, blah blah blee blah to be the resolution to the conflict of what is a whistleblower she reluctantly concedes when no one on the panel lets up but unfortunately as of a few weeks ago on jstock's panel not so erudite very smugly doubles down insisting she was correct and even wishing she'd not conceded recalling some things i've thought in the past it wasn't that I thought you were better than people, but sometimes when I'd criticize you, like one of the things that really frustrated me sometimes when I'd watch you is you would be wrong about something 
and you wouldn't move past it like in a debate and the one that comes to mind is the kicker keep with the whistleblower comment where hey but i was right holy shit i looked it up afterward i was literally fucking right i was so mad holy shit so okay. what was the argument again i because i i uh we don't have to fight about this it's gonna derail it's been but a I, long time i can't remember all the details i if, maybe about alex jones i know alex jones came up i don't know if he was the start of it uh, yeah, I think you were saying that Alex Jones was a whistleblower. Yeah. Um, and then everyone got, like, really intense about, like, what a whistleblower is. Um, but then I looked up the definition after, like, with my chat, and I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> it doesn't have to just be an employee. Like, Edward Snowden is a whistleblower. Um, like, it can be an internal, but it can also be, like, WikiLeaks people are often also considered whistleblowers, even though they're not, like, an internal worker. I don't know. Correct. You do not know. That is literally the only correct thing you've said. A whistleblower is a person who exposes misconduct occurring within their organization. WikiLeaks is not a person, so it is not a whistleblower. The legal protections sought out by WikiLeaks are similar to the protections online publishers like Instagram, Facebook, and X have through Section 230. If whistleblowers want the ability to self-publish digitally, their protections under the law have to be considered applicable to WikiLeaks. As for Edward Snowden, I don't know why Not So Erudite mentions him. Snowden was a contract government employee. He is definitionally considered a whistleblower, but specific to U.S. laws does not qualify for whistleblower protections. Not so erudite joined to talk about how she handles criticism, and she has once again proved that she just simply doesn't. Five months have passed, and she still believes Alex Jones is a whistleblower, and imagines her biggest issue has to do with what fights she takes, and the idea that she is just wrong, I don't think has occurred to her. Not even when her mistake is the topic of conversation. Not like an internal worker. I don't know. It's okay. really pedantic. It's really pedantic. All right. That's I would agree fine. I can get super pedantic. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I can get super, super pedantic about stuff. Yeah. So. It was it was stuff like that, I think. I can't think of another yeah. one off the top of my head. So Yeah, it's like figuring out which bullets you need to like I think a big issue for me in debate, for example, um, is learning which which battles to have. Like whistleblower isn't the battle I need to have. That's stupid. Like just be like, okay, well, whatever we want to call it and move on with my life. Rather than being like, no, it is this thing. Um, so yeah, I'd agree. You don't, okay, so you don't want to debate is what I'm hearing. Like, because in my mind, debate no. is always going to be something. <laughs> okay, that's your mind. In my mind, debate is a different thing. See, we're debating, we're, it's a debate right now, and I'm trying to understand yours, and but I'm not okay, trying to change I'm going to use the word blah, 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 blah to mean what you're talking about. So when I okay. say debate, I mean trying to convince each other of an idea. And when I say blah, 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 so I mean you're condescending having a conversation. I, my definition I'm not is. condescending. I'm saying... Well, blah, I don't... blah, blah, blah sounds a lot like blah, blah, blah to me. Agree to disagree. All right, next part of the topic. And I'm not trying to rush you or invalidate you. I don't know what we're disagreeing on. Oh. Oh. You said vulnerability and all this stuff is like a part of your thing. If you'd like to yeah. stop talking, that's fine. It's what not I'm... that I want to stop talking. I'm just fucking confused, dude. I'm trying to explain it. If you keep yelling at me. I'm not. I... Oh, and now she... Okay, you know what? I promised myself I would set a clear boundary. I do not like the way you're painting me right now. You can think about me what you wish. I feel like this conversation is no longer productive. It's unsafe and it's unhealthy. So I think it's it's not... I think it's... It feels like, if I'm being honest, it feels like everything that I'm saying to you is like backfiring. And I don't know... I don't know why. I'm not sure what's happening. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, you're valid to feel that way. I was really hoping not. Fuck. From the very beginning, I was like, oh, she feels a little bit kind of like Max Lab Looney, but I hope not. I'm just going to give her the benefit of the doubt. Oh, I'm so mad. Those types, like, piss me off. Whew. Okay. Bye. Bye.
Why do you, you hate me so much? Why do you hate me so much? Well, there's something about your personality that is deeply unsettling because I think that you are never you. I think that you are always someone else and it's very hard to read. And that, I mean, that directly is at odds with my trauma that is constantly trying to sift through everyone to make sure that I'm safe. So, Wait, so I think the reason that... you don't like me is that you can't see me very well? Well, no, I don't think that you're Why a very that genuine to, like, person. Compassion? No, uh, I don't think that you're a genuine person, so you scare me. Laugh wants you like, to drop some like slurs, then she might believe you're- oh. like, If I drop like three <laughs> N-words, would that, would that do it for you? Um, no. You're like uncanny valley of people to me. Okay. Interesting. Are you talking about Kyla or Cherry? I don't think they'll come on at the same time? Or I think- I don't think Erudite will. Erudite's already said she doesn't want to talk about this publicly. Yeah. I don't even think Erudite would come on to talk about it publicly, even if Cherry was not there. No, no. I think I have no idea if this is true. I have asked her little to nothing because I am horrible at keeping secrets. Yeah, don't worry about it, Wolfgang. I literally asked her directly, and she said no. Sorry. Yeah. I, well, when I said when I said I think she wouldn't come on, I meant no, she won't come on. She's literally told me she won't come on. Well, but not just that too. I'm pretty sure that she has an interest. I don't know. This has not been told to me. It's just knowing Kyla, the little that I know is that. She probably would like to have an interest on preserving or salvaging however little of this bridge is left, even if it's like a smidge. And I'm sure yeah. that her coming on and talking about it would absolutely douse it just because of how well, volatile she, the situation is. I think she knows that Terry has had a very hard few months, and I don't think she wants to like add on to a potential dog pile or like what an online drama could mean for Terry. Yeah, <laughs> if I made that sound like Kyla didn't want to come on because she like was scared or something it was literally she was like i don't think this is healthy and i don't want to do this publicly sure which is completely reasonable it is reasonable but in its own it is also condescending which well you know, she didn't cleaner, sorry so she did not say that to <laughs> anyone else she said that to me personally and probably wouldn't have wanted it even said here so i might have fucked up by even saying that i just meant yeah, she was concerned disgusting. she was concerned that this could work out badly i don't even think like i told her like yeah uh, fuck. Oh, like, in fact, like, one of the things Nick and I have worked on in our relationship is things like shielding him from, like, my feelings. Like, if I'm getting, like, annoyed at him for, like, not very good reasons, we've, like, talked about, like, how it's valuable sometimes to be, like, not showing people you're annoyed if you recognize that it's, like, not the best reason to be annoyed and stuff. So when people are saying, like, I'm fake, it makes me, it makes me wonder if they're just seeing, like, the fact that I'm trying to be kind. Uh, like, I don't, I guess I... I have a hard time like mapping onto like what it specifically would be, other than, to be honest, me wondering if people have watched my content.